Rita. Um, this has been a time of amazing loneliness and solitude for so many folks. I have a number of clients who have no family and are isolated completely because of health concerns. Um, the only person they may see occasionally is who, the person who delivers their groceries or their meals on wheels. So when that happens, of course, then we're sort of faced with how am I in relationship with myself? Um, I don't have another person in the house. I don't have anyone to talk to about my day. I don't, I'm tired of the TV. So I think this has created an invitation for people to change how we relate to ourselves, how we are in partnership with ourselves. Uh, one of my favorite poets and authors is David White, who wrote a book, The Three Marriages. And one of the things that shocked me about that book is the third section of the book. The first two marriages he talks about are um, the, our marriage to work, whatever that looks like, whatever we do for a living. Um, our marriage to another partner and what that looks like. The third one is our marriage to ourself. And I kind of went, what? <laughs> um, and he's like, yeah, how are you a good wife to yourself? How are you a good husband to yourself? And he said, this is the hardest marriage. Is looking at how it is I treat myself. Do I treat myself like a loving partner? Do I treat myself um, like a loving friend? Um, or do I treat myself like someone who is angry and shaming and using all of those negative relationship things? Self-critical, do I, you know, throw all this criticism on myself? Do I um, cover myself with shame and guilt? Do I constantly feel unwanted, rejected, unworthy? We can end up creating this whole cesspool of negativity in how we are or are not relating to ourselves. Um, so I think looking at that as a place of transformation. There are people who are amazing at solitude. They can spend great deals of time in solitude and come out super healthy. They could go into, um, you know, what is it in prison they call the punishment where you're put in isolation. Um, solitary confinement. Solitary confinement, yes. And come out mentally ill or they can come out quite healthy. And a lot of the studies look at how they are in relationship with themselves. Uh, there's some great stories around Nelson Mandela's time in prison and how he nurtured that healthy relationship with himself so that when he came out of prison, he was healthy and grounded and could go on to lead mm -hmm. South Africa. Um, part of that too is cultivating a sense of belonging and realizing even though I may be alone, I'm still in solidarity with an entire planet. Um, when I feel alone, when I feel isolated, at some level, it's a illusion um, because everything vibrates together on the planet. You know, I'm still surrounded by the divine, inside and outside. Um, so there are some wonderful meditations that help can help a person get back in touch with belonging and solidarity, mm -hmm. even when I can't be physically present to others or they can't be physically present to me. Um, we've been doing some things therapeutically with things like weighted blankets or you know, kind of cuddling ourselves so we get at least some physical um, sensations that way of being held. Um, massages are a great resource and many places have started under really restricted ways of being safe can give you a really great massage. Um, moving the body, walking, all of those things can help us in relating to ourselves. Nurturing ourselves with food, being mindful around how we're eating, being mindful of what I'm filling my brain with in terms of books or the media. Um, and all of those things are like, 
I'm doing what a good friend would do for me. A good friend would say, don't watch that TV program, watch this one. <laughs> um, because this one is gonna help you to be more grounded in reality or will make you smile or laugh. Um, I know some people have completely sworn off watching the news uh, because it seems to be again stuck in a in a narrative and a story that is not very helpful all the time. So how do we look at uh, connecting in that way? Some people have chosen to foster animals. Um, some who may listen to this may know Carl Schneider. He was a young man who grew up at Calvary. He decided during quarantine to become a foster parent to a dog. And uh, of course, after two months, the dog is now becoming permanently Carl's. <laughs> um, but animals are also a great source of companionship uh, during a time like this. And again, you can be a foster caregiver and not necessarily be committed to keeping a pet forever. Um, and I think all of these things also speak to how we are, we have this inborn need to love others. You know, loneliness is an indication that I have love to give that I'm not giving somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm lonely, I often ask myself that question. Um, who out there could I give some love to? Um, mm -hmm. and, and there are ways of connecting up with other people, even strangers, whether it's in a book club or a, Bible study or a prayer meeting, but it, taking the risk of figuring out the technology, taking the risk of meeting new people, even in quarantine. Um, mm. I know people have met neighbors because now they're playing music across the back fence or across their balconies. <laughs> um, so even under quarantine, we can meet new people and mm. as well as become a better friend to ourselves we can extend that friendship to others. Does mm -hmm. some of that fit, Morgan? Oh, absolutely. I, I really appreciated um, the comment that loneliness is an aspect of us having love to give that we can't give. And I think that's definitely part of, especially not just the Calvary community, but collectively, whether it's family, friends, um, folks we may have visited if we live in a um, neighborhood or residential um, assisted living center where we go and visit somebody just to ensure that they knew they were seen and heard and, and thought of. And when we can't do that, that loneliness can manifest. And that's very helpful because it also gives us, as you were saying earlier, um, whether it's a card or um, different creative ways of making that contact right mm -hmm. um that loneliness can be a avenue for figuring out who am i missing being able to love and express love to or mm -hmm. um and then the the marriage to self i think is also really helpful language um i'm somebody who sees things visually and so when i think of like am i a spouse to myself and am i a good one like that brings up a whole nother set of questions and, yeah, and thoughts. Yeah. Um, but it is helpful because you don't have to be married to have that understanding. Um, and while that, that language is a, a partnered language, it's really like, how do we also understand ourselves as, as created in the divine and how do we honor that? Um, and how do we navigate just the feelings that we might be having because sometimes just as you know we were talking earlier about miscommunication with family friends uh, partner sometimes we don't like the feelings we're having and so then we have internal dialogue around how we're feeling or experiencing and that can produce guilt and shame and thus we sever that connection with self as well and so that's just a really helpful image to be able to also have different talking points with, with yourself around how am I doing and how am I nurturing that. Um, knowing that that can sustain depending on how long these safety measures continue. And if we, you know, 
have to go backwards in safety measures being more restrictive than we are right now and going back to sheltering at home <clears throat> and feeling like, oh my goodness, I can't even go socially distance, visit somebody. It allows all of us, whether we live with folks or not, to be able to continue to work um, on how we are so that we then know how we relate to others. Um, so that's, those were really helpful um, nuggets mm -hmm. for me to also ponder and think through um, because it, it matters, right? You can even be surrounded by people and feel isolated. It's not a matter of um, physical connection as much as it is an internal connection with self and other. I think that, you know, when you were talking about having love, loneliness is a sign that we have love to give, that we're not giving. Um, one of my favorite stories during this time of COVID, um, someone passed away and gave their church a very significant endowment. And the church decided to actually divide it among all the members of the congregation to give away. Oh, wow. um, find out somebody who'd lost a job or somebody who was in need or somebody who was lonely. And the stories that have come back have been amazing. Um, and I think some other people sort of caught the, the movement of that and have become like secret Santas. And they're just randomly, you know, will drop off food at a neighbor's house with a note or, you know, will randomly leave a card in somebody's mailbox that they don't even know, um, just as a way of that practice of being of service and feeling like I still make a difference in the world. My life still matters. Even if I can't leave my house, how can I make my life matter uh, to someone else? And then, of course, there's all kinds of avenues for doing that, but I think we feel differently when we even if it's anonymously, we've reached out and touched somebody's life. Um, and uh, you know, reminded somebody that they're beautiful, that they're loved, that they matter. Um, so that, that's been a really cool thing to see happening. Um, yeah. Of course, part of this journey of giving and receiving is really being mindful of our expectations because because our expectations um, and reality sometimes are very very far apart and when that happens we create suffering the distance between my expectations and my reality so i also have to be uh, aware when i'm being upset or angry or disappointed because others aren't meeting my expectations. And then of course, I go to those negative communication patterns like being critical or judgmental. Um, so the invitation is always to how can I let go of my expectations or create expectations that are more reasonable and really ground myself in reality, uh, both my own reality and the reality of the other person. Like when I'm requesting something about my needs, am I being realistic? Of course, when we create suffering and we start stewing in it, um, we often end up transmitting it to others. So that's why it's a good practice, first of all, to become aware of our pain and then see how we might transform it. And this is sort of the fundamental of all spiritual practice. How do I heal and transform my pain and suffering so that I don't transmit it to others? When I do that and I stand in mindfulness, and, the, and some of you are familiar with this term, um, mindfulness, awareness, is to have a balanced acceptance of my present experience, right? letting go of my expectations being really present in the moment. Um, and it's not more complicated than that. Then I can open to receiving the present moment, pleasant or unpleasant, just as it is, without clinging or rejecting. 
Um, and of course, the present moment isn't always pleasant. Um, so learning to sit in the unpleasant moments uh, invites us to practice compassion. And it took me a long time to realize that compassion and empathy are two different things. Um, we can be empathetic with someone without being compassionate. Um, empathy implies that I kind of feel what you feel. I get what you're going through in some way. But often when we have empathy, we also want to fix it, right? I, it's unpleasant. Oh, you're sad. I don't want you to be sad. I want to fix you. I want to make it better. I want to comfort you. And in many situations, uh, that denies the other person's experience or minimizes it, um, or it's like, okay, now I have to change how I'm feeling because it's not going to work in this relating. So compassion allows us by being completely present to what is and honoring another person's experience, honoring my experience, being fully present. We surrender control of, of the outcome in order to be fully present. And when we do that with great love, we have compassion. Mm -hmm. um, I learned so much about compassion when our son was dying. And this is a photo of us around Brandon's uh, bed at the hospice. Um, our daughter, Brianna, um, her partner, Sean, and my husband, Brad. Uh, he was in a coma for 20 days before he died. Mm -hmm. And it was such an amazing outpouring of compassion because, of course, nobody could come and make anything better. Nobody could come and fix this. Nobody could come and change what was happening. Um, but they could come and sit with us, which wasn't always very pleasant. You know, it wasn't a place to come and feel good, um, even though there was laughter at times around his bed. Um, you know, as we recalled stories and uh, but it was just really this phenomenal experience where people showed up without any expectation just to be present to what was really happening in the room. Mm -hmm. And of course, it led to some really profound, meaningful moments of love and um, depth and soulfulness um, and presence um, that would take a whole nother <laughs> presentation mm -hmm. to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> But I think in this time when, when any kind of contact is so precious, being able to show up and just hear where somebody is, even though I can't fix it, I can't make it better, I can't get the quarantine to end, um, how can I just show up and be with you in the fact that this all really hurts right now? This is all really difficult. This is all exhausting and lonely. And can I just let that be shared with me? And can I share mine? and accept that this is something we can't fix right now, but we can just be together in it. Um, and I think that kind of practice is becoming very important in a time like this. And I think it's part of what was so evident, like in the balconies of Italy, you know, with people oh. sharing music, it's like, we can't, we can't make this better, but we can show up to each other. Or when we were howling in our backyard, our neighborhood did pretty well for a while howling at eight o'clock um and again it was like we were just being present to each other we can't fix this we can't make it better uh, but we want to know everyone that we're here put together in this <laughs>